The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents a debate review of Is Islam True? with Hussein. Hey everybody, hope you're doing well. I recently did another debate with another Muslim sponsored by Modern Day Debates. Um, this one was at DebateCon 3, which took place in Dallas. So I actually drove up and was there in person. I, I, I like those. I like being there live. You don't have the same tech issues. You do have different tech issues. So there were issues with, you know, mics. And I, I know when you go to watch the video, you can't always see the slide content. Um, and as you can see from the opening, uh, I have to turn around to look at the screen to take notes on the slide. And there's a reason why I had to spend so much time taking notes in the slide. But Let's start with what happened before we ever got there when we were discussing what this debate was going to be about and how it was going to go. Um, Hussein did something that uh, earned my respect and a little trepidation to begin with. Unlike most debaters, he sent me a list of exactly which propositions he was going to be presenting. That very rarely happens. I will do my best to get definitions, but I'm not like, what is your debate strategy? I want to know, you know, you present whatever argument you want you want, you feel like, but uh, all I'm looking for is let's make sure we have the topic and we get the format and anything else you want to tell me is fine. I don't give out my prep to people generally ahead of time, but that's going to change because I'll be debating a Muslim at DebateCon 4 and assuming um, we agree on the topic, I will be posting a video in just a few days with what will be my uh, opening remarks for him to review for months before the actual debate. I can, how can I get any kinder? But in Hussein's case, he told me that he was going to be defending basically an argument from contingency, that there is a necessary being. This also extended to Allah from Islam. Is that necessary being? Then he was going to defend or support, use scientific findings in the Quran to support uh, that notion of Allah being the, the necessary being specifically. And then that's all he told me about. But when we actually got there, he added that he was going to be spending a portion of his debate opening talking about prophethood in order to show that Muhammad was, you know, the, the one true prophet and last prophet of Islam. Although, honestly, he didn't touch the uh, last prophet part. He just kind of assumed it. Um, in preparation for this, because he sent me his opening, I had no idea who he was. I, I don't know this individual. I don't know what he knows. And I, as some of you know, make it a habit of not going and watching other debates that my opponent has been in or done. So I, I do that. And I, like I've said before, I'm not sure that I have the best reasons for it, but I feel like if I prepare for the topic instead of the person, it goes better. And it keeps me from making some mistakes, which happened also, I think, uh, in the debates there that took place later in a debate review I'm going to record here in a little while. Uh, so I think I can avoid part of that by not focusing so much on the person I'm debating and just sticking with the topic and the arguments in general. Um, because who we are and what we think and what we've done in the past isn't relevant to the subject of the debate. And when you make the debate more about your opponent, which Hussein ended up doing, you lose. It, you, you have veered away from the topic in hand and you're now debating well, I got to take out that Matt guy, and that Matt guy is the threat, not the arguments, not the substance. So what I did to prepare is I wanted to make sure that there was a clear understanding, both on my part and on the audience's part, of arguments from contingency. And I wasn't sure how much he was going to explain, but I wanted to be prepared to explain the arguments from contingency in a way that anybody could grasp. So I spent a good deal of time putting that together. It was still a little disjointed at the beginning. I'm not, I, have, I have no reason why it's that way other than I got up at the crack of dawn and drove four hours to get there for, or three hours to get there for the debate. But the other thing that I prepared for specifically was science in the Quran or scientific findings in the Quran or scientific findings that we hear assertions about they are in the Quran. And what I did in that is I noted specific verses and problems and questions for each of the most common claims. If you go out and look up scientific findings in the Quran, you'll get a whole bunch of YouTube videos and you can go through and watch them. And I'm sure there are other atheists that have gone step by step through uh, to say, hey, 
here, this one's wrong. This one's not uh, impressive. It's not factually accurate. It's this. Um, I've seen some of those. And so I took really extensive notes because there are things where they want to claim, oh, well, you need to read it in Arabic. And here's what the word is and here's what it means. But then when you point out how uh, a particular word is used other times in the Quran to reveal other information that con con conflicts with the way they're trying to present this case, um, that's a good rebuttal. It shows that they're the ones that are engaged in something like uh, cherry picking or, you know, selectively uh, interpreting the passage rather than just saying, oh, the infidel has taken it out of context. These debates are very repetitious. This is the third or fourth or fifth debate I've done recently on whether or not Islam is true. And all of them spend the bulk of their time focusing on science in the Quran. So I'm going to run through a number of different things that he presented and what my thoughts and objections and concerns are to them. Uh, and then wrap this up. He said he was going to present three arguments, the first being a cumulative argument from necessity, the contingency arguments, and that Islam is the most compatible God uh, to be the one that we, or that he argues is, necess is necessary. Then he was going to focus on scientific evidence for the Quran and then evidence from prophethood or ways to, to demonstrate that Muhammad was a prophet of God and uh, the last prophet. And I'm going to read something that he said in his opening right at the start. It's fairly early within the first minute or minute and a half, I think. And he said, I find it hard to convince everyone if they're agnostic or atheist on the concept of God first. We'll get back to that a little later. It was an important admission before he actually started getting into anything. And I really, it, it stuck with me but it really resonated on review. So we'll get back to that. He presented the argument from contingency, but specifically he said contingency through fine-tuning, arguing that the universe is fine-tuned for life. And my response to that immediately is, is it really though? Um, he asserted it, didn't defend it. And then to whatever extent the universe is fine-tuned for life, it must either be fine-tuned in a contingent way, in which case that fine-tuning is contingent upon somebody else, or in a necessary way, in which case the fine-tuning is a function of the universe and does not need an explanation beyond itself. It may be contingent on the existence of the universe. Who knows? So he assumes fine-tuning and then categorizes it as intentional, directed tuning, rather than just the universe has properties that permit life. And that's what's really going on. We, the universe uh, has properties that permit life, and apologists want to look at those uh, properties and say, oh, the only reason these properties could be the way they are is because someone specifically fine-tuned it for life. Now, we never spend any time talking about the universe being fine-tuned to generate black holes, a, a I think a slightly tongue-in-cheek but maybe serious uh, proposition from Stephen Hawking, or that it's been fine-tuned to birth stars and planets and galaxies in numbers that are absolutely staggering. Um, we just don't talk about that. But it doesn't matter because... Hussein didn't talk about fine-tuning at all. He just asserted that it's the case. And then went on to say, if that tuning is by necessity, then a necessary existence must account for that fact of that fine-tuning in its entirety. Yeah, if something's necessary, it's necessary and isn't contingent on anything else. So essentially, that proposition is, if the universe is necessarily fine-tuned, then it's necessarily fine-tuned. His next one was, if it turns out that it is contingently fine-tuned, then there must be some necessary existence which can account for any series of contingencies. And that's not necessarily accurate. If the fine-tuning, if it were to exist and be a real property of the universe, which I'm not convinced it is, if the fine-tuning were known to be contingent, what it's contingent on is something that is uh, either another contingency, but ultimately it goes back to something necessary that is sufficient to explain that contingency or the series that led to it. Now, so I guess what I'm really objecting to is that he used, I think, the phrase any series of contingencies, but I think that was just sloppy. And generally he's saying at some point prior to the universal properties that we're going to say are contingent, 
there is a necessary thing. Okay. And in my opening, when I talked a lot about necessary uh, items and necessary facts and contingencies, um, I dug in a little deeper and made sure people had a good understanding of what we really meant. Um, he then went on to say the universe is fine-tuned for life. Therefore, it's fine-tuned by a necessary existence. I'm, the argument, I, I honestly, I tried to look at it on the slides. I, I took notes on it. Um, he rushed through all this stuff, did not defend anything. Um, you could have, like, pulled him off stage at the beginning and just had someone sit there and read the slides that he put up, and it would have been pretty much identical. Um, it, was a, it was a bit of a mess. He defended the notion that the universe is contingent by putting up a slide and briefly summarizing that slide and talking about uh, set theory and how any set with more than one member is dependent on the members of that set, which means that any set that has more than one member is contingent and that infinite sets have more members. So an infinite set is dependent on its members. And so the set of things that are in the universe um, are that set is contingent on the members of that set being the things in the universe. There's a number of big problems here because you, you could ask about the set of necessary causes or potential necessary causes and whether or not that is contingent and whether or not it makes those things contingent. But because you've identified a set of contingent things, that doesn't mean that, that the set, uh, it, it's not normal to describe the set as contingent on its members. That's not really the way we look at set theory. Set theory is us defining a set and then we see what something either fits with the set description or it doesn't. And it doesn't matter how many things in there. You can have an empty set, you can have a set of one things, and you can have set with infinitely uh, endless series of, of items that would qualify as that set. But a set with one member is just as contingent on that member as a set with two members or five members or a million members or infinitely many, even though infinity isn't a quantity. I'll use it that way this time. Um, because if you're going to say that a set is contingent on its members, then a set with no members would be contingent on nothing, despite the fact that sets with no members are incredibly useful in set theory. And I don't know why there is this seemingly um, off-the-cuff, uh, exception for a set with one member. It reminds me of the beginning of the Kalam cosmological argument where we say, not we, but the, the ones presenting the argument say everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. And that's because the original version of the argument was everything has a cause for its existence. And somebody said, hey, what about God? And I'm like, well, God didn't begin to exist. So everything that began to exist has a cause. And so this is kind of the same way where you'd like to say, hey, uh, is every set contingent? Okay, then is God the, the set of all necessary things? Ah, yes, but that set only has one member. So it's the set that's contingent on it and not the actual item in the set. It's a very confusing way of looking at set theory, which is descriptive uh, to help us understand how to categorize things uh, and then combine that with necessary and contingent items. It's very strange. Um, it, at about 18 seconds into the video, he starts his opening. And in two minutes and 20 seconds, so by the time we get to two minutes and 40 seconds into the video, he's covered the entirety of his contingency argument, dismissed the notion of a multiverse out of hand, jumped into set theory, and then moved on to the next topic in two minutes and 20 seconds. I've already spent, I'm pretty sure, more time than that talking about his opening. And I focused a great deal about contingency arguments and necessity in my opening in preparation for this. He continues on to his argument from oneness, um, which he spends 25 seconds on. Again, throws up a slide and basically says that if why necessary existence is more probable and cannot be any other way, so there can only be one necessary existence. That's it. I did it a little bit quicker than he did. Um, because he spent time dismissing the Trinity and polytheism in order to assert that, assert that Christianity's God can't possibly be the, the one we're looking for. Uh, there was nothing explained or defended, just a slide and then moving on. And then um, 
he, at about three minutes and 11 seconds, he goes on to the attributes of a necessary being and he lists them off. Uh, the necessary being must be independent, one, uncaused, no beginning or no end, which is, that's uncaused. Um, the no end part isn't. First cause, has no parts, cannot be seen, no space, no time, has a will, is intelligent, is infinite, is all powerful. None of these things were defended. None of them were explained. None of them were justified. It was just a list of properties read out. And while we didn't spend much time on the contingency argument or the properties of a god, uh, in my opening, I addressed, I don't see any reason to presume that even if there was a necessary uh, fact or a necessary foundation that, ex that, that the contingent items or apparently contingent items in the universe were in fact contingent on, I don't see what the justification is for determining that it is an agent with intellect or a will. Um, as a matter of fact, I went with uh, sideline noting the mathematical foundation as hypothesis. And so he just reads the list. I'm not convinced, and this isn't to insult him, but this, I'm not convinced that he understands any of this. And when we went in to try to dig down deeper to get explanations, um, he never really explained in any detail uh, anything, either his arguments or his epistemology. Uh, at three minutes and 52 seconds into the debate, he spent 40 seconds listing those properties and then 20 seconds fumbling around and then giving up because he, he thought he had a quote from the Quran that mentioned contingency but couldn't find it, so moved on. And he moved on to the evidence from the Quran. And he spent most of his time in his opening here. It starts about four minutes and 15 seconds in. And again, I'm not trying to disparage him, but you can watch the debate for yourself. I took a note during the debate that this felt like I was, I was hearing someone who watched a video on 10 scientific facts in the Quran that atheists can't answer. And they just took notes on that. Didn't bother to look into it to find out um, what if it was true. It felt very much like a bad book report from someone with no real understanding of the subject who was parroting other people's arguments and who hadn't investigated to find out if the scientific facts were true or really sitting down to figure out, was it impressive uh, for people to have, for, for the scientific findings uh, to be vaguely represented upon interpretation in a Quran, as if people 1,400 years ago couldn't tell that skin has pain ref reflected, uh, detection in it. They don't necessarily know the process. We, we just, you know, in recent modern times discovered, oh, here's how, what pain receptors are and how they work. But anybody 1,400 years ago that got their hand pinched or in a fire or even just smacked or we know that skin senses pain and yet this was a significant, I mean, this is something that I would not have possibly listed in my list of scientific findings in the Quran. And yet it was prominent enough for him to include it in his quick run through of a whole bunch of things from probably some other video. Um, he spends about six and a half minutes on the Quran science. And then he talks about uh, how you can tell that Muhammad is a prophet of God. He doesn't really address that Muhammad is the last prophet of God. I'm assuming that his justification is by the time you conclude that there is a God, that that God is Allah, that, that God, Muhammad is a prophet, and then the Quran is what Muhammad has testified to, and the Quran says that he's the last prophet or gives that impression clearly, then that's where the conclusion comes from, but he didn't defend it. Um, what he did say was this. If you were to ask, is Muhammad a prophet? you would have to ask, was he doing this as a self-serving enterprise or was he earnest in his prophethood? Now, we'll set aside the, the clumsy tautology there by asserting that he's a prophet in the very issue of how we determine if he's a prophet. Um, the case was made that he was a good guy who was considered honest and he was offered women if he would stop preaching. And because he turned it down, that means he's a prophet and he had a tiny place to live with not many belongings. And so I asked later, essentially, is anybody who is of modest means, who 
uh, is sincerely prophesying or you know giving out predictions on behalf of God, are they all prophets? And he comes up with, well, are they performing miracles? Okay, well, now you've added a criteria. You, you started for the first time in his entire opening. He started to present a methodology. Here are the questions you need to ask to, to determine whether or not Muhammad's a prophet. And he didn't quite finish his methodology. It has holes in it. And so when I asked questions that exposed those holes, he got a little frustrated and tried to turn it around to get me to explain my epistemology and what would convince me. Um, when he went into this thing about, oh, well, are they making predictions? Um, of course, there are people associated with non-Islam or with, with uh, religions other than Islam who made predictions and people found impressive and want to claim they're prophets. You're, you already know this because your religion is derivative of two other religions that do that with Judaism and Christianity. Um, but he, his claim was that Muhammad made amazing predictions like the earth would spew forth its treasures, which in his mind predicts the valuable oil that no one could have known of 1,400 years ago. Uh, it's a brilliant example of taking facts and spinning a post hoc uh, connection to a vague, interpretable passage. When it says the earth will spew forth its treasures, uh, I, I was asking him, do you think people 1,400 years ago didn't realize that there are treasures from the earth, both in the sense of literal, like, gemstones, but also the food could be viewed as the earth spewing up its treasures. Uh, the spice trade... The, all of these things, and, and, you know, Muhammad was a merchant. And I'm like, if they didn't understand that the earth had valuable treasures, what do they need merchants for? No answer. Um, we addressed this a lot. We talked a lot about how to tell whether or not Muhammad uh, was a prophet. And his entire justification was essentially rooted in testimony. He kept arguing about the number of people who claimed to have witnessed a miracle. And I was pointing out that claims aren't evidence, something that people have taken me to task for, uh, and yet most of them are confused. I'll, I'll probably clarify at a later time that I'm talking about the claim isn't evidence of itself, and the utterance doesn't make it evidence. But claims can point to facts, but it is that, that connection with the actual elements of reality that determine whether or not the content of that claim is evidence, but the content that would be considered evidence is evidence independent of the claim or the claimant. It doesn't have to be from someone. It's just facts about reality. But he wants to accept the claims, and his justification for this, because uh, Aaron got up during the Q&A and, and kind of called him out by claiming to be Zenu and then trying to get him to admit that now he had evidence for Zenu. He's like, oh, no, no, I don't believe you. And he, 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 and there was lots of chuckling and, and nervousness in there. I don't want to beat somebody up for it too much. But if you say that your justification for believing miracle claims is the testimony, and then we say, yes, but the testimony isn't enough to conclude that a miracle happened or likely happened. And his answer, which was couched, and I had to tease it out a couple times, was essentially... I already believe that there is a God who can do anything, and therefore these miracle claims are not extraordinary if you already believe in God. So his methodology is if you start with a God belief and God can do miraculous things, then when there are claims that miraculous things occurred, those are no longer extraordinary claims. They are now consistent with something else you already believe in reality. And then those miracle claims can then, in a dizzyingly circular line of reasoning be used to support the notion that you started with at the beginning, which is that there's a God. So his basic thing is, because I already believe there's a God, if someone says there's a miracle, I will accept that because I believe that there's a God who can do the miracles, unless it's a miracle from some other religion that might conflict with my views. Now, there was something that he said early in his opening remarks that I said we get back to, and here it is. He said, I find it hard to convince everyone if they're agnostic or atheist on the concept of God first. This is a, a key admission on his part, and he doesn't even realize it, and he included it right at the beginning of his opening. Essentially, if you begin with a God belief, all of this Islamic stuff becomes 
eminently more reasonable because if you believe that there is a magic being that has all of these uh, properties and capabilities, then reports about those things become more mundane. And if you don't believe with that, if, if you don't believe that to begin with, well, it's going to be much more difficult to convince you. Yes, and thank you for admitting that you have an absolutely abominably flawed epistemology in what would have to be the most obvious way I can imagine. On multiple occasions, I tried to drill down to what methodology is he going to use to confirm a miracle? What methodology is he going to use to confirm a prophet? There was no methodology presented. And when I pushed he just began to ask for my methodology, including demonstrating that he wasn't listening because even after I gave a short answer explaining why my answer to what would change your mind about God is I don't know and here's why, immediately after presenting that, I kid you not, he asked me what would it take to change my mind on God? And he came after my epistemology and repeatedly made suggestions that nothing would convince me. I'm just too skeptical. And so when asked to defend his epistemology, he just repeatedly launches attacks, which I called out during the debate, repeated ac accusations that are, in fact, completely irrelevant. My epistemology is irrelevant to whether or not he has a sound epistemology. I could be completely delusional with the most horribly flawed foundation, methodology, and epistemology that anyone could imagine, and that would in no way be a defense of his position, which is what he's literally there to do. It's just dishonest and an ad hominem, even though not a fallacy, an ad hom attack to say, Matt's too skeptical, therefore I've made my case. No, I'm not, and no, you didn't. What you did was barely present an entry-level book report on things you clearly didn't understand, and then did little more than snicker and present ad hom attacks against me rather than defending your views. I genuinely hope we find some Muslim apologists that can do better than the four or five or three, however many it is now, that I've done in the last couple of months. Um, because while I have Christian friends that I talk to, I don't really like sitting around with both of us going, gosh, these guys can't put together a sound reasoned argument and can't engage without attacking the individual across from them. Maybe we'll do better. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.